Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Jerusalem. Now joining us again is Michelle Warshawski. He's the author of the book On the Border. He's also the founder of the Alternative Information Center in Jerusalem. Thanks for joining us again. Hello. So we left off talking about how the uh, hard right uh, in Israel, and which is now well represented in the government, uh, was, is not uh, satisfied with circling Jerusalem with settlements. They, they want a much more provocative which thing, which is actually try to push Palestinians out of the center of the city, which has put them into conflict uh, with the United States, who wants to see some kind of negotiations going on, at least they say they do. Uh, so to what extent do you think there's a real divergence of interest here between US, the United States or U.S. policy and, and this Israeli government? Unlike some of my colleagues in the Alternative Information Center, I do think there is a crisis. I don't think there is, anyone wants, neither in Washington nor in Tel Aviv, intends to challenge the strategic alliance between the U.S. and Israel, something which is here to stay for many years more. But there is a double conflict. Uh, first conflict, I would call it almost personal. Obama is the enemy of the ne American neoconservatives. He, he was an alternative to the failure of the neoconservative foreign policy. While Benjamin Netanyahu is one of the founding fathers of neoconservatism, as an American and an Israeli together, he already in the 80s was formulating the neoconservative strategy with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the role of the United States as a unique power, seemingly, uh, in the world. So Benjamin Netanyahu and his uh, uh, team are really uh, uh, acting with the worst enemies of uh, opponents of Obama in the United States to destabilize it and at least to, to make it a bad memory in a few years from now. Some parentheses, miserable parentheses, in an era of neoconservatives. This is the conception of Netanyahu. Speaking of the Obama administration, it, sh it, yeah. it should be considered a footnote of exactly. what the real relationship is, which is, is with the... And what is real America? Or re real America should be the uh, America, the United States uh, government. This is one level. And the connections between uh, Netanyahu and his team with the neoconservatives and with the evangelists, who are also enemies of Obama, and they are a strong power in the United States, is part of a tension. But the tension is not only on that level. It is on the strategy in the Middle East. When Obama gave his speech in Cairo a year ago, the Israeli leaders, really, it's not uh, an image, it's real, were sweating. Uh, uh, the television was very good on that. You saw all the leaders doing that kind of movement. Uh, they felt something new is happening. The way. Obama administration is seeing American interest in the Middle East is absolutely it's very different from the way Netanyahu and his neoconservative friends uh, look at it. I believe there is here a real divergence. While George W. Bush used to say the key of stability in the Middle East is Iraq, Obama is coming back to the old uh, Clinton conception, the key is to resolve the Palestinian issue, to neutralize the Palestinian issue. As long as there is a Palestinian issue, we'll have troubles in the Middle East. And you had support recently. General Petraeus said something more or less the same in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and, and some of his other generals have been saying, actually went so far as to say American soldiers are dying because of lack of resolution of this conflict. Of the Palestinian conflict, of the uh, conflict in Palestine, definitely. So we are back to an old po American policy, uh, and the, the only question is how far that administration is ready and able to go in pressuring Israel. We need pressures. Whatever will be the government, but certainly with that government, we need American pressures. Uh, without pressures, it will not work. And there have been precedents of pressures. It's not something new, it's not Obama. Eisenhower was putting pressures on Israel because of his, the, the framework of the Cold War and his rapprochement with, uh, attempt of rapprochement with Soviet Union. Later on, Bush father, put a lot of pressures, pressure, $13 billion loan guarantees in order to obtain freeze of settlement because he promised it to the Arab regimes that were in alliance against, uh, with the United States. So is, is this the essence of the, uh, 
divergence of interest is that there's been a lot of promises made to the Arab regimes, starting with the Sauds, who, have a, who are in their own right very powerful in Washington and, and very powerful in the region. The conflict with Iran and, and the uh, role that the U.S. plays uh, it makes it very easy for Iran to demonize the United States in the region. So, uh, uh, but uh, is this more, is it something that stays at the rhetorical level of spat with Obama and Netanyahu in Washington? Or, or do the Americans actually no, put something think, behind this? I think there are strategic objectives. If, and this is what the Gulf states are saying to Washington, if your enemy is Iran, if your objective is to neutralize Iran for being a local big power, you have to strengthen us. We are threatened by Iran. But in order to strengthen us, you cannot let Israel do whatever they want. Because this, otherwise we will be looked as completely uh, complices of Israeli occupation and Israeli colonization and repression of the Palestinian people. So it's, a complicated, it's, a, it's an overall regional game where Iran has a very important role and the Gulf countries also. And the conflict between Shiite Iran and uh, Sunni uh, Gulf countries is real. And they are threatened and they have a big Shiite minority which is frightening them. And in that sense, the problem of, of Obama if you are speaking about such challenges, global, regional challenges, one additional settlement near Hebron or in the heart of the old city looks really ridiculous. And this shouldn't be an obstacle in order to, to put into motion a reshaping of the Middle East, a needed reshaping for the, American, for the US administration. Now, this is the political root of the tension. While from the point of view of Benjamin Netanyahu, Precisely, the conception of trying to, to re-stabilize the area is not his agenda, because it's not the agenda of the neoconservatives who have an agenda of the permanent war. That with these Arabs and these Muslims, we have nothing to negotiate. They are a danger, they are an enemy. We have to control them as much as possible and to, 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 to attack them if they don't accept our hegemony. And in his government, at the political level, and, and I, my question is how much at the level of the economic elite, is there a basic belief in greater Israel? So a, a two-state solution just cannot work if your vision is greater Israel, and you don't really care what the American strategic problems are. The question is not whether or not a Palestinian state. I think there is a consensus in Israel that there should be a Palestinian state, because we have to get rid of Palestinians, to get rid from our state. Uh, we have to get out of the permanent dilemma whether we have a democratic uh, uh, Jewish Arab state, which is out of question for any kind of Zionist conception where Jewish state is important, or we'll have what we have in fact, but we will have to admit that we are in an apartheid state, a Jewish state with a strong minority or even maybe a majority without rights or without, without civic rights. Now, th both options are bad from the point of view of the Israeli leadership, all, all together. Um, so, yes, a Palestinian state, even uh, Netanyahu, but the state being not partitioned between Israel and, let's say, most of the West Bank plus Gaza as a Palestinian state, Israel being a state from the sea to the Jordan River, with the exception of the lands we don't want because they are heavily populated by Palestinians. This is a, the old Sharon plan, the cantonization. But, but even that, there seems to be, every time there's about to be some kind of progress in talking, even if it's to get to this cantonization or Bantu stands, people have called, even to get there, there seems to be this government seems to block any uh, attempt to even get to that point. Uh, this government right now uh, is not ready to negotiate nothing. Is not very good, uh, ready to negotiate nothing, and I would have been doing the same at their place, because there is no urgency. For there, there is no urgency, no pressure. No American pressure, no European pressure, no economical pressure, no military threat, no uh, terrorist threat. Everything is fine. And a very Israeli way to deal with politics, which is not Israeli but colonial, is you deal with the matters of today.
don't think about tomorrow, because if you think too much about tomorrow, you know that there is no tomorrow. So is there enough divergence of interest here for the Americans to give this a sense of urgency, or is this some rhetoric to please... No, it's more than rhetoric. In my opinion, some of my colleagues will, will disagree with me. So they're, they're going to assert, assert some There will pressure. be pressures. There will be pressures. And I think uh, uh, if we listen, for example, uh, not in APAC, because th these are more pro-Israelis than Israel, more fanatic than, than the average Israeli public opinion. But if you take J Street, this is what they are saying to Israel. We are lovers, we are friends of Israel. Stop it. It is bad because the President of the United States and even the United States House of Representatives and Senate are first of all defending the interests of the United States. There is nothing like love in politics because they love Jews or Israel, and many of them don't love Jews whatsoever. And now the way the Israeli government is handling the situation is getting, this is what Petraeus was saying, the interests of the United States are threatened by, the continuous, the con by this continuous Israeli policy. Now, some of the Palestinians I'm talking to say the kind of two-state solution they're talking about leaves the Palestinians with such a, a weakened entity that they, it's actually it's, it's not worth it. It's better to be in the current situation than to go to such a, a sham. This is a debate, or, or the f I call it the false debate, about two states or one state today. Um, as if we are speaking, we are in a supermarket. I, I hate it often in, in public debates here and in Europe, but more in Europe than here. Mr. Warshavsky, what do you, uh, you don't prefer one state? I prefer one state to two states, as if we are in a supermarket. I like big beer or a pack of six small beers. It's not a, a, a question of uh, uh, what I like and uh, uh, what seems more nice or more beautiful. The option was, and this is the root of the Palestinian so-called historical compromise of Yasser Arafat, our rights, said Yasser Arafat, is on Palestine. This, this is our homeland. It's the homeland of our, our, our father and forefathers. But in order to reach it, it will take generations. Because you can reach it only in two ways. Either by military ways, and this will take time until we will be, we'll have a, a regional and international situation where we can hope to reach it. It will take many, many, many years and generations or by convincing the Israelis that this is the best way to do it, like Mandela has done it. This will take even more generations, because the huge majority of the, Israeli, of the Israelis want a Jewish state. In that sense, having a Palestinian or state, one state in Palestine, is a long, long-term struggle. In the meantime, we'll eat a lot of shit, a lot of dispossession of maybe expulsions, uh, uh, colonization, uh, repression. I can guarantee this was an offer of uh, Arafat in, in late 80s and throughout all the 90s, a solution which is a big compromise, a painful compromise. We will have to renounce 70% of our homeland, but something for this generation. Now, the Palestinian made the choice with a lot of difficulties to say, OK, let's accept the compromise, and who knows in the future after two states will coexist for one, two, three generations, we can reunite something more natural, more normal, more... The problem was, when the offer was made, we were living in one kind of world, fall of Soviet Union, uh, the neoconservative recolonization of the world, and the recolonization of Palestine. At the very moment the, the, the compromise was on the table, the Israelis said, we don't want any more compromise. We are re Occupy. Which is essentially the neoconservative vision. We're now one superpower world. We have enough military to do what we want. What we want, and we don't negotiate anything. And Palestine either. Sharon was the first to, to understand. He said, compromise now, we will take more. What seemed to be a realistic, short or medium term solution is not anymore on the agenda. We may be back to the solution, but we have to understand to the solution of one state. But what is relevant is not one state or two states or three states, or who knows, maybe a confederation with Jordan, that there is no short-term solution, that the, the, the time factor has changed. The 80s, maybe part of the 90s, were still 
or 70s, 80s, 90s, were time of decolonization. Palestine was one of the last not to be decolonized. When the negotiation of decoloniz decolonization started, it was al already the beginning of the turn to recolonization, the neoconservative recolonization of the world and of Palestine, with Benjamin Netanyahu who was the chief architect of both, of the global one and the local one. Now the question is uh, for the Palestinian leadership, for the Palestinian national movement, is to reshape a strategy, a long-term strategy. The time frame which was, gave a logic to the compromise of Yasser Arafat, to the two-state solution, changed. I don't claim to have an answer. I have only one suggestion to all of us. Let's think the new reality and, and, and the new time frame. So in the, in the next and for now final segment of our series of interviews, uh, let's talk about the coming decade. Please join us on The Real News Network with Michelle Warshawski. <laughs>